I think there are a number of factors at work in the decline of American politics, if you want to call it that, over the last uh, 10, 20 years. Part of it is they've been just been going through a series of traumatic events in the United States that would, you know, I think in any society, would cause divisions and polarization, whether you're talking about the September 11th attacks, even though those were initially unifying, but the aftershocks, the Iraq war, uh, whether you want to talk about the financial crisis and everything that went out of that. And I think one of the th consequences of that in terms of the present campaign, so there were these divisions and polarizations before between the parties, but now you're seeing divisions, of course, within the parties. Uh, and you're also seeing a kind of, a, I think, a, a variegated sense of our institutions and our elites have let us down. Uh, you can't trust anybody anymore. You can't rely on anybody anymore. There's no authority. A lot of things are contributing to that, some of which, as I say, is the, are these traumas they've gone through, some of which is, is social media and the rise of the internet where everyone thinks they're an expert or if they're not an expert they can, they can just look it up on Google and that will give them all this. So there, there's this decline of deference to um, received wisdom and in part, of course, that has a positive side. Uh, nobody wants to just be a slavish follower of authority. But if we just have total contempt for anybody who knows anything, if that in itself is just a dubious idea that, that expertise or knowledge uh, can, can teach us anything, then I think you get some of the know-nothingism that we're seeing in, in, in the politics today. Um, as I say, there's an upside to the sort of revolt against elites that, that uh, you know, some of the, the old ways of doing things maybe weren't working for America anymore, whether on the right or the left, and people, I think, uh, have a perfect right to, to want to challenge that. But somehow it seems to have sort of slipped out of the bonds of ordinary um, debate uh, into something much uglier. I think it's certainly the case that we have had some similar events and factors and some differences. We have not gone through anything like the trauma, the serial trauma that the United States has, has gone through in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, we didn't have anything like the same collapse of the housing market or the financial crisis that they had. Uh, we obviously didn't have the, the same scale of terrorist attacks, although terrorism is certainly part of our political equation. Um, but we certainly have had some similarities in terms of the rise of social media and the you know, concomitant rise in identity politics, which has a particular passion to it. Uh, that I think is often unfortunate. It makes us, in, makes us incapable of actually listening to each other's arguments because why should I listen to you? You're from a different group than I am. Uh, I think that's hurt some of the discourse even in this country. Um, yeah, but we just haven't been wrestling with the same scale of problems. So there's, there's been that factor has been missing from it. And I think that's a big part of why we have not um, uh, descended to quite the same level in our discourse. We have not discredited all of our elites the same way the United States has, rightly or wrongly. We have not, uh, you know, we had our, we dabbled a bit in contempt for expertise under the previous government. I think it was one of the less attractive features of that government was, was this tendency to sneer at um, uh, expertise. Uh, and, you know, the sort of symbolic uh, fight over the, over the, or more than symbolic fight over the long form census being the classic example of that. Um, so we've emerged out of all of that, uh, you know, in a relatively better state, frame of mind. It's always colored with, you know, a bit of complacency. That's part of the Canadian makeup, and sometimes a bit of, you know, back patting, uh, uh, especially when we're telling ourselves how modest we are. Um, but all in all, I think it's a much healthier. Uh, the, the, the body politic in Canada is in a much healthier state of mind than the Americans. In contrast to the state of affairs in Canada, it does seem things are falling apart, for lack of a better term. To what degree do you sense that this is something that can or will be put back together, so to speak, once there is uh, a president-elect and, and people are looking forward, versus is this a dynamic that is going to sort of continue feeding on itself until there's, until there's a serious sort of reshuffling of the, of the institutions that create the political life? It, it's very hard to know <laughs> what's the Yogi Bear line. This, the, 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 it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, it, it, a lot of it can depend upon what happens in the election. If Donald Trump wins the election, if he becomes the president, we are into utterly uncharted waters. We've never, ever had a candidate like him in so many ways, and most of them unpleasant in terms of just the lack of basic knowledge about institutions' work the lack of caring about knowing about that and other things, the, the wild policies that he's periodically put forward and then rejects the next day and then picks them up again the next day after that, um, and just the contempt for basic norms. And my great worry specifically about Trump as president, because you get people saying, well, 
how much can a president really do anyway in the American system? It's the separation of powers and, you know, I think that that doesn't reckon with the fact that the, the, the degree to which institutions and laws and rules, all those things are important, but they're all embedded in conventions and customs and norms. It's a convention that we obey the law, for example. If we all collectively decided we weren't going to obey the law, the law wouldn't matter a whole lot. And my great worry with Trump is that he's not bound by ordinary conventions and, and, and understandings that make the system work. And I'll give you one sort of example. This may sound a bit wild, but I don't think the present system, I'm not sure anything's wild. You know, at the height of the Watergate scandal, uh, you know, Richard Nixon came under, they, they, they went to, to court to try and force him to hand over the Watergate tapes. And the Supreme Court ultimately ruled you must hand over the tapes. And Richard Nixon, who was quite prepared to break the law when nobody was looking, wouldn't do so in public. He handed over the tapes and ultimately was his undoing. I'm not so sure President Trump would hand over the tapes. I'm, you know, you just don't know how far he would push things. Uh, you know, he's just not bound by the same conventions. So th if Trump wins, everything is up for grabs. And, and I, I have enormous fear for what happens to America, what happens to the world. If he loses, which I pray and hope, and which is still the likelier probability, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how the Republican Party uh, uh, remakes itself. There's a school of thought that says, well, the forces that he represents, the, the, the passions and the ideas such as they are, and the, certainly the resentments, are not going to go away. That This is the beginning of a long uh, um, uh, campaign in that regard. I'm not so sure. I, I think those resentments may be there, but you always need, I think, a triggering event or a triggering personality. And if Trump is such a unique character in terms of his shamelessness, in terms of his money, in terms of his raw talent, it should be said, of a certain kind, that without that singular individual, I'm not so sure that Trumpism uh, carries on. And he is, after all, pushing, if he's not over 70. Uh, but nevertheless, there will be a day of reckoning within the Republican Party, and the people who acquiesced in or supported Trump will be, uh, one has to assume, at daggers drawn with the people who uh, openly uh, denounced him and disdained him, and they'll, uh, you know, it may, be the, it may be for the best for that party to just sort of have that out. Um, and, and, and the ideal scenario would be, of course, that, that they, uh, they decide that they're not going to go down that route anymore. Um, so do you, do you see a sort of implosion uh, in, term, in the Republican Party's future um, if, they, if they do lose, and, it, it, or even I, if they win? And what would that look like? It, I think it's actually more dangerous to the party if they win, because Again, the, 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 the actions of a President Trump are so unpredictable, and, and um, it, it's, just, it's, it's just very hard to see how, they, how normal, conventional Republicans could work with it. So you could, that could be very realigning in some way that's very hard to, to see down the road. Um, if, if they lose, it, it just depends how badly, I guess. Up until about a month ago, it looked like he was going to lose pretty badly, and uh, th that would that would offer the opportunity to kind of really discredit Trumpism and, and, uh, and hopefully lead to that being sort of marginalized. It would be harder to argue that this was sort of the wave of the future or what have you. If he loses narrowly, then, it, then the party, I think, is into a very prolonged period of infighting. Moving then from the domestic to the international arena, so with respect to, to either candidate, what, what's your sense of how the election of either one or the other will impact America's foreign relations going forward, whether it's Clinton and her critics sort of dogging her for her apparent hawkishness relative to other Democrats versus Trump's apparent taste for Vladimir Putin and, and strongman politics? Uh, if Clinton is the president, I think that is a very relatively knowable scenario. Yes, she is uh, much in the mold of her predecessor in terms of domestic policy. Um, I don't think we'll rock too many uh, boats in that regard probably a bit more hawkish uh, than Barack Obama on foreign policy. Um, that <laughs> doesn't take a whole lot of doing, frankly. Um, uh, but I think that's a, that's a knowable uh, scenario. Uh, if Trump is the president, uh, it, it, again, it depends to whether he actually follows through on some of his policy pronouncements. But if you take them at face value, that he's not only going to renegotiate or, or withdraw from NAFTA, uh, and not only he's not going to go near the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but he's talked about blowing up the WTO, the World Trade Organization, or pulling out of it. Um, he's talked at times as if he almost wanted to pull America out of NATO, uh, or certainly radically 
remake it and turn it, you know, instead of saying that this is a collective defense uh, agreement, this will be some sort of protection racket where if you pay him enough, then, then he'll you know, make sure your, your country doesn't get invaded. Um, the, the degree to which he seems to be willing to pander to and acquiesce in, for reasons unknown, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, is enormously disquieting, and not only in terms of his obvious admiration for his dictatorial tendencies, but when he starts saying that essentially, well, you know, Crimea is really Russian territory, or I don't know whether we would uh, come to the aid of, of a country, uh, a NATO member that was attacked by Russia, this is enormously destabilizing. It's destabilizing even for him to be talking about it. Um, you know, and, and when he justifies this by saying, well, I like to be unpredictable, unpredictability in foreign affairs and in security arrangements is toxic, is worse than toxic. It is potentially uh, tragic. Uh, that that's how wars start, is when people miscalculate, when they, you know, they don't, not on the same page because somebody's being unpredictable. Um, so, and then and go on and on. He's, gonna, he's given a nod to saying we should have uh, nuclear weapons in, the, in South Korea or in, in Japan. These are not the understandings on which we've been governed for the last decades. And while I'm all for people uh, casting a fresh eye on things, I don't have a lot of confidence in this particular pair of eyes. What do you say to folks, um, I suppose largely a younger demographic, but not only here in Canada or, or elsewhere in the developed world, that see Trump and they, and they see him for the... Um, the, the disturbing political figure that he is, but at the same time, people are like, well, you know, America's had its day in the sun. It's time to change things up. I, I almost wish that Trump gets elected so that the international arena will, uh, you know, the balance of power will somehow shift. W what, what, do you, what do you say to that line of argument, and, and what do you expect would actually come of that? W would the balance of power shift or in a positive or negative way? Short answer is be careful what you wish for. I mean, it reminds me a little bit of some people who expressed nostalgia for the Soviet Union, you know, days, because then they could kind of keep the Americans in check and that kind of thing. Well, yeah, but let's think that through of what the Soviet Union stood for, what it subjected people to, of, of living under the nightmare of mutual assured destruction for 50 years. Uh, I am not sorry one, one iota that, that the Soviet Union is gone. I am uh, uh, sorry that the Pax Americana seems to be uh, in some doubt. Uh, we can all be critical of American this or American that, but if, you know, this was, I think, a, one of the better guarantors of world order, and I think uh, um, has proven its, its, its merits in that regard. Uh, it, it may well be the case. We don't know. Nobody can predict the future that whether the American empire is an eclipse or not. It's been predicted many times, but not necessarily, and it has enormous enduring strengths in terms of its entrepreneurship, in terms of its universities, in terms of its military, uh, and, and uh, I wouldn't want to count them out for one second. But if you are moving from a unipolar to a multipolar world, that's an extraordinarily delicate exercise in statesmanship. And you're reckoning with a lot of things, not just strategic factors, but you're reckoning with, among other things, the emotions of the polity that you're governing. Uh, one of the disturbing factors in world affairs right now is the emotions of Russians at seeing them lose their empire and feeling that their pride has been wounded. And, and Vladimir Putin has played to that uh, to the nines, and that is enormously destabilizing because that's how you get things like Crimea. So if we are in a scenario, and I, as I say, I don't know whether we are, but if we are in that scenario of some sort of uh, uh, managed decline of the American empire, I want that requires all the skills of statesmanship we could possibly uh, ask for. And, and again, Trump is not the person to deliver that. Assuming that America is in some form of decline, whether it shows itself in the international arena or domestically, given that here in Canada, we're so, our fate is so closely tied to that of the United States, what, what do you anticipate are going to be the repercussions, one way or the other, for Canada and its role in the world and its, its trade relations and its economic stability? Again, if, if Hillary Clinton is elected, I think it's pretty much steady as she goes. She has been pulled to the left on trade issues. So she now sounds like a critic of the Trans-Pacific Partnership when earlier she used to gush about it. Uh, and who can say who the real Hillary Clinton is, but my gut feeling is the first one, the, the, the one that was in favor of the TPP, is more in her nature. Uh, and uh, so I think she will have to obviously deal with a Congress of whatever stripe, and there is definitely protectionist sentiment afoot in the United States right now. This is a periodic thing that comes and goes in American politics. Um, but I would not imagine, for example, that much would change with NAFTA with, with Hillary Clinton. Again, with Trump, all bets are off. Uh, 
again, he would have to deal with the Congress and, and could not simply unilaterally tear up NAFTA. And it would really depend on what kind of uh, Congress was elected along with them, and that's a lot of unknowables in that. But if I had to bet, I, I, I don't think that we would see a lot change with NAFTA, even with Trump. I don't think. Uh, um, it's just, it, 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 there's a lot of moving parts there that he doesn't necessarily um, control. And, and again, you know, it's just hard to know from one day to the next, never mind from one year to the next, what his position is going to be. He's been on all sides of every issue. Uh, so you could imagine him uh, turning around and saying, well, I, NAFTA's the best thing since sliced bread. I, you know, you just don't know. Uh, but he certainly seems to be much more uh, aimed at Mexico uh, than Canada. And, and I guess the main question for Canada was avoiding being hit by the, you know, the sideswipe uh, by whatever he did to, to try and um, impress his followers with how tough he was being with Mexico. In terms of economic leadership, but also in terms of the sense of security in Pax Americana that you were describing, assuming there is a decline or we're in the middle of it, are there any implications from a strategic point of view for Canada? Are there security concerns? Are there other things that, that if you were in power here in Canada, you would be wanting to think through ahead of time? Uh, I'll just push back one more minute on, on the uh, whether America's in decline. Let's not forget the demographic uh, equation in all this. So along with the enormous American military, which dwarfs all of the world's militaries combined, uh, and along with its residual economic and cultural might, uh, it's one of the few countries over the next 50 or 100 years that's not going to see a population decline. Uh, Canada is one of them. Uh, England is, or Britain is another one, so assuming they don't to break up. But a lot of these countries, like Japan, like uh, Russia, like Germany, uh, these countries are looking at prolonged declines in population. And you want to talk about a difficult problem to manage. Uh, they'll have their own problems. So that being said, uh, the Pax Americana, whether, whether it would, even before the Pax Americana, the, the Cold War had, it own, had, it own, has, had its own stability uh, and its own terrors, but it was a, a, there was known equations there, and you could you know, rough out some kind of logic to the positions of the two sides, and Canada kind of nestled comfortably within that, uh, basically under the American nuclear umbrella. That had its downsides, as it did with, with Europe, that if countries don't think they're responsible for their own defense, it, I think it encourages a certain fecklessness. And a lot of Canadians, I think, somehow managed to convince themselves that we were a neutral country. You could actually get people telling you this uh, when we were members of NATO and 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 if we were a nuclear uh, a neutral country, we'd be the first one on earth that had its defense paid for and, and looked after by another country. I mean, genuinely neutral countries have fearsome armies because they know they have to defend themselves. Uh, um, so that had its own stability, and the Pax Americana that followed it, uh, from our perspective, was more or less more of the same, that, that, uh, that our security was essentially, in, in, in an existential sense, was looked after by the Americans. We were responsible for things around the, the, the coastlines, et cetera, but, but uh, in terms of existential threats, the Americans would defend us. If, we, if that really breaks apart, uh, and if we see the kind of a great power rivalry and great power uh, uh, adventurism that we're seeing with Russia and with China right now, uh, that's enormously concerning uh, for Canada. And it certainly means, in my opinion, it certainly means we need to be very conscious of um, uh, being playing our part in, in means for the collective security in things like NATO or whatever succeeds NATO. Uh, um, but it, 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 at that point, it, you know, we're out of the illusion at that point that uh, everything's going to remain stable because Uncle Sam's going to see to it. We're in a much more dangerous world, a un very unpredictable world.